Thank you so much for joining us. You're obviously most well known for your acting work on Casualty Doctor Who and your great role in uh, Invictus, the Nelson Mandela biographical film. Uh, but you've also done quite a lot of theatre work. Loads, yeah. So how, how do you sort of compare the sort of different styles? Do you have a preference for which style of acting you prefer? Um, no. Uh, I do loads of radio as well, and I do audio books, and I think all of it is, it's about storytelling. Um, and different mediums require different skills. Uh, if you're doing radio or you're doing audio, you can't go, yeah. you have to do that vocally. How do you do that vocally? You know, so it, it pulls on those different skills. But also I think it talks to us in a different way. You know, if you're, if you're um, in a theatre play, um, the audience has a choice as to where they send their eye. Yeah. If you're watching a movie, you are completely at the mercy of the editor and yeah. the director. Uh, if you're listening to radio or you're listening to an audio book, you bring your own witness, your own richness to it, um, because it's your imagination that is inflamed, rather than having someone else's imagination brought to you as as a stage or film or TV. So. Um, they all demand slightly different things from you, but I think what you want is you want to feel you're being authentic to the story that you're telling, that you feel it's a story that's valuable, worth telling, and you feel it's a story that's um, sincere within its own frame of reference. Yeah. Obviously, sort of, film actors and movie stars get a lot more attention and sort of publicity. Do you think that theatre and radio sort of acting gets the credit that it deserves? What, it depends what you want. I mean, I don't know if um, publicity and attention is the credit that anybody deserves, yeah. really. Um, I think if the work is good, the work is good, and that's the attention. If you think the artist is good, then you'll want to be interested in the work that they do. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, that's about how thin or fat they are, or who they're having sex with, or what their particular imbibing habits might be. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think if you if you have a love for um, a particular artist or a particular form of art, then you'll pursue it. I mean, I think what's great that's happening now, so at the moment I'm in Julius Caesar yeah. at the Bridge Theatre in London, Nick Heitner's new enormous theatre by yeah. Tower Bridge, and um, uh, it was something that started under his uh, stewardship of the National, that the NT Live thing. Uh, I think NT Live has been wonderful transformational um, for culture in this country because, you know, I grew up in a tiny uh, sheep and cow village in the middle of the Cotswolds, two buses a week. Um, people from that village don't necessarily have access to the ENO or the Royal Ballet or the National Theatre, but now they do, because yeah. they can go to our little 50-seater cinema four miles up the road and they can watch it. Um, or my mum can watch it in Shropshire or, you know, whatever. So um, I think that the, the place of um, those live arts uh, is shifting in the public cultural consciousness because of the access that they're getting in different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, here in Cambridge, in London, in, in, in big cities or big cultural centres, we have, we have such fabulous access to, yeah. to work. And, and now that's sort of getting a bit more of a democratic spread. Yes. So that's good. Of course, outside your acting career, you've also been quite vocal about uh, your experiences raising a transgendered son. And I, I watched your TED talk, and there was one quote that particularly stood out to me. Uh, you said your tomboy daughter was sort of the son that you'd always never had. Um, but in fact, you actually had him all along. You just hadn't realised it. Mm -hmm. um, how was that sort of realisation process? Because you obviously said there were some struggles. Mm. So my question to you is, why did that stand out for you? I think that quote in particular was just because it just seemed like something so common sense. Yet, in a way, we never sort of realised those things until they actually happen. Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of the way you said it, it's sort of in the middle of the speech and it was just like, oh yeah, 
that's just so obvious. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, common sense. I think that's a good that's a good phrase because that's what it felt like um, and obvious, absolutely. And I guess that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I just was really struck by the quandary of if a child has been one gender all their life and now they're a different gender and they resonate as exactly the same person, what does gender mean? Yeah. What, what is gender? How, how, how was gender making that person? Who was that person beyond their gender? They were this thing that remained permanent and I would call that permanence the, the unique essence of who each individual person is. And I suppose what that realisation kicked off in me was a sort of conversation about who are we and why do we allow ourselves to be judged and to judge other people by external uh, signifiers. I call it the fleshy overcoat, i.e. your melanin or lack of it and your genitals yeah. um, um, covered with the scarf of faith, sexuality, class, education, um, geography, income. Mm -hmm. So um, the combination of those two things can, can, can completely cloud the essence of the person or restrict or hamper. I mean, uh, you can say, yes, poverty can be a great hamper, but great wealth can be a great hampering force as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the child that goes to private school whose parents go, you will study this because I'm paying this many grand a month for you every term and you... Yeah. Who may be forced into a career that they don't want any more than the kid who doesn't have access is forced into a career they don't want. So I'm interested in what happens when we slow things down and I don't know you till I know you, yeah. till I sit with you, till I spend time with you. So I'm interested in the heart-to-heart -heart connection. That sounds like the 80s show, heart-to-heart. Um, anyway, but that's what I'm interested in. I'm in the heart connection. Yeah. What's your heart to my heart? How do they resonate? Is there a connection there? Because that connection will have nothing to do with the fact that you're this height, you're called Jonathan, that you're yeah. this colour and that you're this gender and you're studying p the poles for your masters. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, wow, that's interesting. Who are you? Why would you want to study the poles? Why, why does that resonate with you? Those, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, so um, that's what kicked off the TED talk, uh, and I guess that's what's kind of kicked off why I'm here tonight and the conversations that I have with people now. Um, it's sort of foundational because um, I, I preach as well. Yeah. Um, I'm on the sweary socialist feminist end of the Church of England, I confess. Um, but uh, it's, I, it, I suppose, it. I don't talk about religious terms particularly, but I just think each one of us is a unique yeah. being, creation, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and I think the world would just be a richer place if we were allowed to flourish in our uniqueness rather than being forced into stuff that it does not make us happy, does not fulfil us, and that we don't do very well because it's not our thing. Yeah. You know, I worked for Lloyds Bank for a year and a day, exactly. I was the worst bank clerk in bank clerk in history. Um, whose books didn't balance at the end of most days and everybody wanted to go home and they couldn't until they all balanced? <laughs> Why? I wasn't supposed to be a bank clerk. Me yeah. and numbers? It wasn't necessarily, you know, my finest moment. But, you know, give me a part that I can get my teeth into and I'm off. Yeah. And I'm happy and I'm good at it and I'm flourishing and hopefully I'm making some sort of connection with people watching. So I do, I genuinely think um, for us to live a life where we're just longing for the weekend or our day off is not a life. Yeah. And, uh, and I know I'm very privileged because I, I don't have to do that anymore. But my big encouragement would be for us to live in a world where people were given the space to be more who they're supposed to be. And that's also about the value judgments that we place on people we don't know. Yeah. So for any sort of people who are going through it, maybe particularly other parents who uh, have parents with trans kids or trans parents kids with or kids where they go oh my god who have you turned into uh, I'll let you uh, decide how you want to answer the question but is there anything that you'd sort of say to them that I suppose I would say 
that when you had your kid, you brought a unique, blessed being into the world yeah. with blessings of plenty to offer the world, um, with joys and wonderful, unimagined things coming their way. And as a parent, it's your duty to help your child thrive. Yeah. And how, wherever that takes you, you just got to suck it up, baby, and go with it. Because you're their parent. You're supposed to be their port in the storm. You're supposed to be their safe harbour. You're supposed to be their loving anchor in the world. So. Okay. Thank you so much for joining Welcome. us.